everybody, you're listening to Renewal Cast, a weekly podcast that features interviews, discussions, and teaching on various biblical and theological subjects. And my name is Colt Robinson. Jay Whiff and I do this because we believe um, that our minds are to be shaped and renewed by the life giving and transforming Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we pray for the next few minutes as we spend some time together that you will see Jesus more clearly. Today we have D.G. Hart with us, and uh, Jay is going to visit with him about uh, Machen. And as Machen said at the end of his life, we are so thankful for the active obedience of Christ. There is no hope without it. So we want to talk about uh, Machen today. Enjoy the conversation. Welcome to Renewal Cast. We have D.G. Hart with us again. And this time we're talking about J. Grisham Machen, and there's an important anniversary this year, but first, Dr. Hart, would you introduce yourself to us again? Oh, sure. I am Daryl Hart. I prefer to go by DG, at least in print, because nobody can spell (laughs) Daryl. I teach history. At Hillsdale College, uh, gladly, uh, joyfully, I, I really do. I love it here. Uh, I've been here about 13 years. I've I've taught at Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, California. Um, started teaching at Wheaton College uh, when I first finished graduate school, um, and I've written written some stuff, um, and I'm glad to have written. Uh, what I wrote, but the first book was on J. Carson Machen, which we'll be talking about today. Um, it was my dissertation at Johns Hopkins, and it has uh, surprisingly to me in some ways stayed in print uh, mm-hmm. since it first was first published in 1994, although it was published by a, a university press, Johns Hopkins, um, but then Baker picked it up as a, as a reprint in, in uh, paperback and then P and R books picked it up and has kept it in print now since, I don't know, maybe 15 years or so. Um, and it, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a worthwhile subject to be sure. That's, that's the reason for it. But I do hear from a lot of people um, how much they appreciate the book. And I think I do try to situate Machen in a wider context. Um, and it's not, um, hagiography, I don't think, but, um, and there's a lot of scholarship in it because that was my dissertation and it's all buried in the footnotes at the back. But, um, some of that stuff still holds up, I think. Yeah. Why have you been doing so much traveling recently? (laughs) Because of Machen. Um, (laughs) I mean, a lot of people have scheduled, conferences um, around the 100th anniversary of Christianity liberalism. And um, I guess I've had at least three trips, no, four now, uh, this fall. It wasn't so much in the spring, um, but this fall has been really cluttered with a lot of um, Machen Events and I've had been having to um, dust off notes, but also going back and rereading Machen uh, on my own. And um, I think I've come up with some for me are what are new and um, persuasive uh, aspects of of Machen's thought that I hadn't developed as much before. And I come away, walk away yet again with a great appreciation for. Uh, his clarity of thought, his uh, conviction, um, his theology, as well as um, his scholarship. Yeah. So, so who was he? Well, he was a um, son of a prominent Baltimore attorney. Uh, grew, he was born in 1881, uh, lived in probably the the um the nicest or at least the nicest new neighborhood in Baltimore it's where a lot of elites 
lived, Machen was part of that society in part because his parents were part of that society. Um, he, he went to a, a Southern Presbyterian church. Um, the, the Northern and Southern churches had split during the sectional crisis of the mid 19th century. Um, <clears throat> his mother was from, from Georgia, excuse me. His father was from Virginia. So they, he identified as a Southerner, even though Maryland was upper South, um, to be sure. He went to Johns Hopkins as an undergrad, um, studied the classics, did a master's degree there as well, but wasn't sure what to do with his life. His older brother followed his father into law. Machen thought about law. He thought about banking. Um, he really did struggle, and he I think he went to Princeton Seminary as kind of a place to go because he didn't know what to do. Um <clears throat> And he even admits that he wasn't a great student. And um, I mean, he was a very good student. He got great grades, but he wasn't diligent. Um, he went to a lot of ball games, whether football, lacrosse. <clears throat> um, there's a canal on the Delaware River near Princeton that when it froze over was a great place to skate. You could just skate in one direction for miles, which is he did. He rode his bike up to New York. He went to plays. He went to bookstores. He was, um, he was a rich young man who had, um, lots of interests and he explored a lot of those interests while he was in seminary, but he finally settled down and went to Germany after Princeton and studied new Testament. And then after that, he came back to Princeton and started teaching in 1906 and taught there until 1929 with the reorganization of Princeton and the founding of Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. He did do, uh, served about a year in World War I, not as a soldier or chaplain, but he worked for the w Young Men's Christians Association, the YMCA, hoping to lead Bible studies to do kind of parachurch work among the soldiers. Um, but what he had to do was run a canteen, which meant mixing hot chocolate and selling cigarettes in addition to the religious activities. Um, and I do think the war really changed his outlook on uh, society and progress and um, problems in the church. I think he came back very much sobered from his experience there. And again, he, he's involved in... Controversies, 20s and 30s, leads to the formation of a new denomination now called the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. But he wrote a number of books uh, in the scholarly world. He wrote a book on the origin of Paul's religion in 1921. Really superb book, actually. And, um, and then The Virgin Birth of Christ was another really um, weighty scholarly book. <laughs> published in 1930, but in between he wrote Christianity and Liberalism, 1923, a argument against uh, liberal Protestantism and what was wrong with it. What was so wrong was that it was uh, an altogether different religion, he argued. Um, and then he also wrote a book that really doesn't receive as much attention as it should have. Two years later, a book called What is Faith? Hmm. Making a Case for the intellectual aspects of faith and trust in Christ, which echoes themes that he developed in Christianity and liberalism, but it has its own, its own um, merits as a book. Um, and I wonder if people will celebrate the hundredth anniversary of that the way they have. Mm -hmm. I actually hope someone does. Mm -hmm. I, th I think it's a book well worth um, remembering. When was it written? I'll, I'll 1925. Oh, <laughs> Machen, uh, to help us get to know him a little bit better, had some interesting maybe responses to some things in his day. What did he think about jaywalking? <laughs> well, he was a libertarian and didn't like government encroaching upon personal liberties, but his his argument there about jaywalking was <clears throat> um, 
actually sort of uh, democratic friendly. I mean, as in, I mean, Machen was an elitist and he believed in the value of uh, elite institutions and high levels of achievement, especially in education. But um, his argument against jaywalking laws was that it was an infringement upon people who couldn't afford cars, that basically jaywalking laws were keeping the streets clear so that motorists could just roam, just zoom down the streets at will and not have to worry about about hitting anybody or, or living with people who didn't have cars. So that was part of his argument, aside from the ones about giving people liberty. And, and it's something relevant to the recent years during the um, pandemic of lockdowns, giving people the freedom to figure out for themselves how to protect themselves, how to be safe, um, rather than simply setting up a light and people simply following the light system as if they were kind of robotic. So that was part of his argument. It was like, he did, I think, testify before the city, uh, city council in Philadelphia about the laws and he wrote some letters, but it wasn't a huge thing for him. Right. But, but sometimes right. OPC guys will jaywalk from H and is that, is that true? Exactly. <laughs> and you can do it in the East and nobody, Nobody cares in the East Coast, the West Coast. You can get a ticket. <laughs> what did he think about football on Sundays? He was again, again it. He 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 was a Sabbatarian, as most Protestants were. Uh, you didn't have to be Presbyterian to be a Sabbatarian back then. I I even grew up, <clears throat> grew up in a Baptist home fundamentalist Baptist to be precise, that was um, very Sabbatarian. Um, But when the NFL was looking to start as a league and looking for a place on the calendar when they could play their games, Saturdays were occupied by college football, as they still are. Um, And so the NFL knew it could not compete with college football. That left Sunday is the other day when people had a break from work. And um, so they wanted to, to change laws, the blue laws in many states, which which um, restricted business on Sundays. And Machen opposed it, but not because of uh, his – he did not appeal to the fourth commandment on the Lord's Day as, as at least Presbyterians and Baptists and um, – I guess most of the Anglophone Protestant world regards that as the fourth commandment. I think Lutherans actually counted as the third commandment, the one about the Sabbath. Uh, but he did so because he thought the customs of the American people as a, as largely Christian were set up around having that day as a day of rest. And again, it was sort of a violation of democratic impulses for the state to change a law that the overwhelming uh, portion of the population um, believed in, practiced, and benefited from. I mean, that was part of his argument, too, that having a day of rest, having a day when, irrespective of whether people went to church or not, having a day when people stopped from their ordinary activities, he thought that was a blessing for uh, Christians and non-Christians, and that's how he tried to argue in this letter that he wrote to the governor of Pennsylvania, actually, at the time. Hmm. And the NFL seems to have been quite successful on some Yes. <clears throat> little higher profile, how did he respond to the Scopes trial? He, um, William, Jennings, William Jennings Bryan, the chief prosecutor at Scopes trial, where uh, the biology teacher and football coach John T. Scopes was um, being tried for having broken a, a um, <clears throat> Tennessee law that prohibited teaching evolution 
in public schools, even though the state legislature, I think, also approved the textbook that Scopes was using. So, I mean, the legislature kind of violated their own law, it seems to me. But um, I don't know if they required that textbook, but still. Uh, so, Machen was invited to testify. I think he was a little embarrassed by what he thought might become a kind of circus atmosphere at the trial. So he declined to um, to be a witness, and he said his reasons were that he wasn't an expert in the Old Testament. He also had family obligations with his which, with his mother, who was a, a widow, and, and Machen was the only bachelor son. And there's truth to both of those. But again, I think if he had really been um, – had strong convictions about it, he probably would have tried to go. Um, and that's not to say that he didn't believe in the, uh, creation of, of people by God. It's not to say he believes in evolution, but I think he was like Warfield, uh, Benjamin Warfield, who taught him theology, was open to questions, open to ways of trying to reconcile science and Christianity if possible. And I mean, I don't want to upset any of your listeners, but the first, you know, the first three chapters of Genesis are not easy to pin down about the exact nature of creation and, um, you know, the discrep- discrepancies of time. If if that's the genealogy of the human race, there that means, as Archbishop Usher calculated, that human race was created on. 4004 BC or something. And there's other evidence which, which might indicate that um, human beings have been around longer than that. Um, and that even the earth is older than 4004 BC. Um, but, you know, that's not, that really wasn't at the heart of Machen's concern. He was asked Um, by the New York Times in 1925 during the Scopes trial to write an article about what fundamentalism stands for now. And it's curious, even there, he doesn't really bring up the matter of evolution. He does bring up uh, the matter of the gospel and, um, and why the Bible is reliable about the gospel and why the gospel is really important. Um, And that appeared right across the, the page from a big article by a zoologist, I believe, who wrote an article called What Evolution Stands For Now. So Machen, in effect, was part of the debate in the New York Times, but again, he didn't really go after the scientific question. Sure. And part of his response would have been that the Bible isn't a science book, right? Right. Although it was in the realm of history, which is a kind of scientific enterprise and looking for evidence and facts from the past, he was certainly insisting that the Bible was a scientific book in that regard. Um, and Adam and Eve as historical figures would also indicate that there's scientific, scientific reasons, historical reasons for uh, considering it. Yeah. Yeah. So why did he write Christianity and liberalism? The, um, I don't know if it's a short answer, but the direct answer <laughs> is he went to a general assembly soon after his return from Europe during the war in 1920. And he um, saw there a proposal for a plan that would have united all of the Protestant churches, the major Protestant churches, the so-called mainline, into one communion. And it would have been a, in effect, the Protestant church of America. And this happened, did happen in Canada that Anglicans, Presbyterians, and Methodists united to form the United Church of Canada. Um, Although they didn't unite all of the Presbyterians, Methodists, and Anglicans. And so the church union uh, Endeavor actually produced one more church instead of uniting all of the the three churches. Um, But Machen was alarmed by the proposal. Uh, He thought it 
was indifferent to the teachings of Presbyterianism, its theology, its understanding of scripture. Um, he thought it watered down the faith, even to the point that it, it, it just obscured Christianity altogether. Many of the Princeton faculty wrote, wrote against the plan, including Warfield. It failed in the, in the presbyteries in the church, but it lasts a, a, a lingering, excuse me, mark. And church union was still very much in the air among mainline church leaders. And that's part of the why Machen wrote the book. He gave some talks, gave, wrote an article uh, where he was opposed to this plan and the kind of arguments he was making against the pl- union led to his uh, dissection analysis of liberal theology and uh, why it erred and departed from historic Christianity. Could you walk us through the chapters in that book? Um, so the first chap first chapter is the introduction, at, which is actually really worthwhile, a worthwhile read because here you see an author, which I think a lot of people who write whatever they write um, need to think about their audience and how you can hook readers who don't necessarily share your views or even are not interested in your subject. And here he's part of the introduction trying to um, engage readers who don't even care about Christianity, which gets him into some political discussion, which is a little bit um, specific to that time, but there's still echoes of its relevance for big government to this day. Um, But he also lays out why liberalism is um, is actually a plausible strategy for trying to save Christianity from science, which seems to undermine Christianity. And his point there is that <clears throat> what liberals try to save from Christianity winds up being not Christianity at all, but some a, a religion of uplift of moralism of virtue and not really of the saving uh, work of God in Christ. So so that's basically what this, the introduction does. Second chapter on doctrine is a very lengthy defense. It's just, I think it's the second longest chapter in the book that Christianity is essentially a doctrinal religion. And he was very much arguing against people who thought that Doctrine was basically just an expression of something much deeper, which was Christian experience. And he was saying, no, doctrine actually shapes experience. It produces experience, not the other way around. Hmm. So that's, a, I think, also a very important argument uh, that still, I think, stays well, it's still relevant today when there's so much experiential Christianity around us. The third chapter, he combined the first two points of systematic theology and included God and man in one um, chapter. Um, And here he just defends the doctrine of God, the doctrine of man, especially defending the transcendence of God and the sinfulness of human beings, which of course sets up the need for a savior, but it takes a chapter to get to that. The next chapter is on the Bible which is actually the shortest chapter in the book, maybe somewhat surprising to people who would have been thinking that a person who taught at Princeton Seminary would have spent a long time on the Bible and especially the inerrancy of the Bible since Princeton was known for developing that doctrine quite elaborately. And by the way, quite, uh, I think, um, plausibly and and uh, intelligently. Um, but no, he, he defends the supernatural character and the fallible character of the Bible in that fourth chapter. The fifth chapter is the chapter on Christ. It's um, probably the third longest, maybe the second longest chapter. And here he defends the the orthodox views of Christ as the God man, not as a, a man who was really extra special and maybe had something kind of divine you know, going on, 
he was so great, he was almost divine sort of thing. No, he was going to just defend classic um, Chalcedonian orthodoxy. Um, one, one man, one person, two natures. Um, and he also argues against kind of sentimental attachments to Christ in that chapter. Uh, the chapter on salvation is, um, I think, the longest chapter and it's the chapter where he defends for at least 15 pages, as if I recall correctly, the doctrine of the atonement, the vicarious atonement. He argues against the liberal efforts to, to take the atonement as a, in a vicarious way and the importance of the death and resurrection of Christ, efforts to interpret that away and turn maybe the cross of Christ into an example of self-sacrifice. And of course, that's what all Christians are called to do is to self-sacrifice. So the cross becomes a, a way of example to Christians. And Machen will have none of it. He says, there will be no Christianity without the cross of Christ, without the death of Christ for sinners and their sins and overcoming death in the resurrection. So this is a full on defense of um, the cross of Christ. And it's really, it's just a great chapter. And then the last chapter is uh, the seventh chapter is the chapter on the church. And he gets into the nature of the, of the controversy specifically as it's playing out in the churches. Machen makes points about the creedal nature of the church of all the churches, not just Presbyterians, although he does draw upon Presbyterian precedent in requiring subscription to the Westminster Confession. Um, but he also, though, made some recommendations for what's to be done by conservatives during this time. And and then at the end, I think he, he for me, it's the most moving part of the book of, in this chapter on the church, and it's basically the conclusion, but it is, um, can't there be a place for world-weary Christians to go to church and be able to have fellowship with other Christians around the table of our Lord and not have to hear about the problems of, of society, the problems of warfare, the problems of politics, but simply to worship God and to receive the comfort of the gospel. Um, it's a, it's a really, it's just a very great, ending to the book. And uh, I think in some ways shows that this is by no means an abstract, theoretical, ivory tower kind of defensive doctrine, but very practical for Christians in that in that time and in ours. And I, I do think it's important that people do continue to read the book. And from what I've heard at conferences this fall, people still continue to benefit greatly from it. Uh, it speaks to Machen's ability as a, as a writer and thinker to be able to to um, express himself in ways that are still useful to people three or four generations removed. Absolutely. How does the liberalism that he's he's talking about a hundred years ago? How does that relate to the progressivism now? Um. In so many ways, <laughs> um, I, I can't, I can't spell them all. I mean, if you have, if you have show notes, um, and if not, uh, yeah. I can at least refer readers or sorry, listeners to something I wrote for Christ Overall, a Baptist online publication. I did a podcast with them about Christian liberalism too, but they did, they devoted an issue of a journal the name of which I don't recall, uh, to Christianity and liberalism. And, and in there, I tried to um, spell out some of the ways in which, especially the, the re reactions to Machen by the mainline Presbyterian Church's official uh, leaders was, again, I was deeply affected by the lockdowns and skeptical, not of the virus. I knew it was real and I knew it could kill, but I also thought that government was overreacting. I thought news organizations were also uh, overly dram dramatizing uh, the disease and its effects. <clears throat> and I was especially upset 
about the, the closure of Amer- of society, not just America. Other other governments did it too. I just didn't think that this was the right way to go, even if it were as deadly as people thought. Um, but so we had a period during the lockdowns, and and now it's entered our our discourse, our language as um, just words that we use without batting an eye, like disinformation and misinformation. <clears throat> but Machen, the reaction to Machen by many of his opponents who didn't necessarily take on his arguments directly, in effect, characterized his book as misinformation and or disinformation. They didn't use those words, but it was akin to that. And there was really a um, an intolerant autocratic response by the Presbyterian hierarchy to Machen, his book, his efforts to uh, criticize what was happening in the church, especially on the mission field in the, in the 1930s, which is how the, the controversy played out then. And I, I, you know, I don't know if this is endemic to progressivism and Protestants who wind up being somewhat progressive in their politics, but the parallels are really striking. And I, I think there are other parallels you could draw from the time as well. I mean, a, a kind of sensitive sensitivity <clears throat> to um, cultural diversity and relativizing um, white or European or suburban understandings of Christianity. Um, so again, there are a number of parallels and the one place that you could at least see some of bit of a longer answer that I put in print with with references to um, you know page numbers that from Machen's writing or other uh, related material would be at that uh, crisis center piece but um, I mean I see a lot of parallels between now and the 1960s as well so maybe it's just maybe it just there are parallels all over the course of history. But I think in liberal societies, which is liberal in a good sense, in the American founding sense of liberal society, with limited government and checks and balances in the federal government and protection of uh, personal liberties, those are hallmarks of, of American politics, which went out the window, I think, during COVID. And they also went out the window in the 1920s and 1930s with the Presbyterian Church. Now, of course, the church is not society. It's not civil government, but it had still had laws, had a constitution that would protect people who would speak in certain ways and bring their cases before the courts of the church and publish books, etc. But you had real efforts to try to uh, silence Machen and marginalize him and discredit him which I think was a way to try to protect the brand of the Presbyterian church, the way that you could argue some public health officials, some government officials were trying to protect their own powers during the lockdown. Sure. Yeah. We can uh, link to that in the show notes. Machen in his book uh, really kind of called for the liberals to withdraw, if I remember correctly. But it ended up being him that had to leave a few years later, right? Uh, and, yeah. And some of his his followers then became known as Machen warriors. So what what does it mean to be a Machen warrior? Or how should we think <clears throat> about controversy in the church? <clears throat> well, you're appealing in some ways to an article that John Frame wrote about Machen's warrior children, which credited Machen with being a good warrior because he was fighting liberalism, but then... Machen's children just kept fighting and they wound up fighting each other and they just fought over trivial things, so to speak. Um, And I mean, I I disagree with Professor Frame on that argument, even though some of the particular issues that he talks about in the article about matters that were trivial um, or inconsequential I'd have to go back and look to see how important I actually think they are or not. Um, 
But I think even that line of argument or, of saying that you can't uh, fight over these things is precisely what Machen was facing in the 1920s. People telling him, oh, come on, that's just really not that important. Don't fight over this. Um, and And he argued... I mean, so to your more general question about how should we think about controversy, he would say, well, what does the Bible say about controversy? And he would say that the Bible from cover to cover is a book of controversy. There's always controversy going on among God's people. That doesn't mean that controversy is one of the marks of the church. It does mean, though, that controversy is something that's going to happen because people are fallen. And they have, they misunderstand parts of the gospel. They may have other motives for not being as clear or following scripture the way they should. Um, they may disagree over strategies, but that do relate back to what the Bible requires the church to do. Um, so, you know, I think the pattern of the OPC, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church that Machen helped to found has been, I mean, one of the, if you go to a general assembly or even a presbytery meeting and you have all sorts of rules for conducting debates and people use Robert's rules, et cetera, which is actually a very useful way to, to how, do you, how do you conduct business of a committee of 150 people? It's a really hard thing to do, but Robert's rules they work for Congress. They work for a general assembly, conceivably. But the OPC has an unstated rule that nobody calls the question. If there's a matter, if there's a motion on the floor that people are debating, you don't say move the previous question, which is calling the question, which is mean let's go to vote. There's always room for people to keep debating. And sometimes it does go on longer than it should because people wind up saying, making the same point that three other speakers have already made. Um, but still, the legacy of Machen and what he faced, and also the legacy of Machen and his understanding of the importance of debate in the church, which does, can generate controversy, uh, is one that the OPC has, has strived to protect. Um, so, you know, but I think one of the other pieces I was reading this fall in preparation for some of my talks, um, it's, I think, in a, I, I have a collection of, S, um, I edited a collection, not, I, I, I edited a collection of Machen Shorter Writings, and I think it's in a, one of his essays there on the defense of the faith, and he talks about having been at a conference where someone else was saying how the church really needed to cover, uh, recover the doctrine of love and generosity toward other Christians and, and get beyond controversy. And they quoted, the person quoted 1 Corinthians 13, the great famous hymn to love or hymn of love, praising love. And, and Machen said, you know, what that author doesn't realize is that the, the whole book of Corinthians, but even the pieces leading into 1 Corinthians 13, the, pre the previous chapter and the subsequent chapter are controversial. Paul is addressing controversy right there. So you can't just, you should never just pick and choose from the Bible. You got to be consistent. And Machen's point more generally was that Paul always was fighting in a sense. He was trying to correct error uh, in his, his epistles and and that's just the nature of of being a responsible churchman, a responsible pastor, a responsible Christian. I mean, Machen even encouraged ordinary believers to uh, pursue channels available to them in their churches to try to correct the errors in the church. Any concluding thoughts on Machen's life or his or the book? Christianity and liberalism. Um, I guess I would, s having been uh, earlier this week at John Brown University to give um, a talk on Machen and meeting students there, 
uh, who had been part of a book group discussing the book, um, I was really pleased to see how much freshmen even were excited about the book, um, thought it was really well done. So I, I, I would just say, as I've, I'm repeating myself at this point, but it's a book that still uh, speaks to people this day, even 18-year-olds. An 18-year-old mean this person was born, what, 2005? Um, so, you know, barely any recollection of President Bush, none, of course, of uh, 9-11, uh, probably no m memory of the Great Recession, uh, only probably a little awareness of, of figures like Mark Driscoll or Tim Keller or John Piper. Um, and yet, this is a book that can speak to somebody uh, such as that. And um, aside from the eloquence, the style, the forthrightness of the book, um, it's, it's, it's also just a really good defense of Christianity and a great reminder of um, how God saves his people and the incredibly essential work of Christ. Uh, it's such a, it's such a defense of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It, um, it is truly a great book in that regard. It's a very encouraging read for believers. I think. As is what is faith. That'd be a, a favorite book of mine as well. Mm. So, thanks again for joining us and uh, hope you get to do some more matching conferences. Ha, thanks. Good to, good to see you again. Thanks. Hey everybody. Thanks for listening. You can find more about renewal cast or check out past episodes on the web at renewalcast.com. You can find us on social media, just search renewal cast and thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.